Hello and welcome to Abstract AF, I'm Sneha Jaswal and in this episode we are going to quickly review 10 books under 10 minutes. So let's get to number 1, The Invention of Hugo Cabaret by Brian Selznick, which looks like a big book with over 500 pages of story that's mixed with a few illustrations in between. But once you start reading it, you might have a hard time putting it down. It's about a 12 year old orphan boy called Hugo, trying to fix a complicated mechanical toy because he thinks it may contain a message from his dead father. Hugo is a liar, a thief, a clockkeeper, an aspiring magician and a bit of an imp. He runs into trouble with an old man from whose toy shop he constantly steals, but their equation undergoes a radical change by the end of the book. It's a heartwarming tale and the author spins a realistic yet magical story that's a tribute to storytellers of the past, the dreamers, the magicians and the first filmmakers who brought the magic of cinema to the common man. I'd recommend this book to anybody who loves arts and the movies. Number two. Lucky Penny, a cute graphic novel by Anant Harsh and Yuko Ota. It follows the adventure of a girl called Penny who isn't really lucky. The story starts off with her getting fired from a job and then struggling to keep her life together. If you're looking to read something quick and light, pick up Lucky Penny. It's a funny mix of childish innocence and some mild adult comedy. But the artwork is really nice and you can't help but like Penny's character. Number 3. Sputnik Sweetheart by Haruki Murakami. Now this is a novel with some magical realism in it. Due to Murakami's lucid, impressive writing, most of the book makes for a very interesting read. But once the magical realism bit comes in, it gets a little annoying. It's a strange love triangle kind of story that's narrated by a man who's simply called K. K is a teacher who's in love with a friend from college called Sumire, an aspiring author. But she in turn falls in love with a married woman who's almost twice her age. So there's this unrequited love theme that runs strong through the plot, but towards the second half, things get bizarre and boring. The focus completely shifts to a random affair K is having for a while, and the mood just nosedives. Not a book I'd recommend. Moving on to number four, Jerusalem by Guy Deleuzele. Now this is a travelogue in graphic novel format and the author has the ability of capturing the essence of every place with an unwitting wry humor. Just like some of his other titles, Pyongyang, Shenzhen and Burma Chronicles, the author starts off the narration with his arrival at Jerusalem. This time he's with his girlfriend who works for Doctors Without Borders and their two little kids. The book gives the reader a view of a historically significant place through the eyes of a laid-back, non-partisan observer who believes in show and tell. You get to understand the varied religious and geographical conflict the region is torn in, but in a casual, light-hearted manner. Definitely check out Elisley's work if you like traveling. Number 5. Love by Pablo Neruda, a very small collection of poetry by the famous author and in my opinion an absolute essential for poetry enthusiasts. Neruda's poetry is very soothing and you should try reading just one or two in a day and also try to read them at least twice or thrice to discover deeper meanings. And the good thing about Pablo's poetry is that it's usually themed on romance, life, and his language is not very complicated. So unlike a lot of other poets, if you read it twice, you will understand most of what he's trying to say. Now, number six, Lola, a ghost story, a graphic novel by Che Torres and Albert Orr. This book is steeped in Filipino folk culture and beliefs. Lola is the word for grandmother in Philippines readers are explained. So the story is about a young boy called Jesse who lives in Canada with his parents and they're all visiting their village in the Philippines to attend his Lola's funeral. What I loved about this book is the theme of alienation in what is considered one's own land. So while a lot of authors try to go back to their roots, to the country where they think they came from and try to discover where they're from, here Jesse feels really lost and alone in the country that is supposed to be his home place. The title might seem a little misleading because despite having ghosts and demons, the book isn't really scary. The artwork is on the simpler side and monochromatic. Read it for a slice of Philippines folklore and local legends. Number 7. Turtle in Paradise by Jennifer L. Holm, which is about 11-year-old girl Turtle, who is sent away by her single mother to live with her aunt in Key West in a poor community living on public relief. Now, Turtle befriends an odd but hilarious bunch of boys who call themselves the Diaper Gang. 
because they babysit babies in the neighborhood in exchange of candies as pay. In the author's note, Jennifer talks about how the story was inspired from her great-grandmother's life, who used to live in Key West. So the great thing is that a lot of characters are based on real people, giving them a touch of authenticity. The language is simple, but the author uses a lot of terms that seems to be like slang from the 1930s, so foreign readers may not understand a lot of sentences. Overall, it's a fun book for kids, although adult readers might find the climax rushed and predictably silly. Moving on to number 8, Still Life by Anushka Khan. I have mixed feelings about this book because it's neither a regular novel nor a graphic novel. But it's written like those illustrated books for children where some text is accompanied by pictures. But her book is definitely not meant for kids. It's a wistful, gloomy tale about a woman called Pinky who's looking for her husband who went missing a few days ago. The story picks pace once we get to know a little more about Pinky and her husband. Although there isn't a lot that happens, like the title suggests, still life, and the ending feels a little abrupt and rushed. It's a small book, and if you want to read something simple that's almost a little like poetry without a lot of things happening, still life could prove to be an interesting read. Number 9. The Dark Room by R.K. Narayan Set in a fictitious Malguri, this is a tale of Sarata, a housewife who's treated like a glorified slave. The title is a symbolic allusion to her marriage, which is restrictive and gloomy, like living in a dark room. It's a domestic tale that serves as a cautionary story about the need for women to have financial freedom. While I enjoyed reading Narayan's lucid storytelling, it might not appeal to a lot of modern readers, especially Gen Y and Gen Z readers who live in tier 1 cities. But despite that, Dark Room might be relevant for a lot of people, especially in India. And even though it's not a literary gem, it makes for a quick and enjoyable read. Moving on to the last title for this episode, number 10, A Thing Called Truth. It's a comic series by Ayolanda Zanfardino and Elisa Romboli. A very interesting fun story about a doctor who is on the verge of a major breakthrough but is sacked by her employers because they want to take credit for her work. Upset, the doctor gets drunk at a bar and wakes up in a car that's being driven by a stranger and they're heading to Rome. So it's a mash of science fiction and the classic road trip romance and offers some fun stories. And Romboli's art is gorgeous. I love the colors on the comic panels and it keeps you turning page after page. Well, that's a wrap on 10 reviews under 10 minutes. Talk to you in the next one.